I'd like to recognize that we're honored with the presence of Jürgen Borch, the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany, who is with us today. Jürgen, thank you for coming. Okay. And now I'd like to pass it on to Donna Hicks to, to give us a, her uh, presentation on the subject of dignity. Thank you, Donna. Well, I'm, if, if you're a friend of, and in the inner circle of Tim Phillips and the, all the people in Beyond Conflict, you end up in some pretty interesting places. And I think this is, this is one of them. And my, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to address this group um, and, and share my, my research, my, my, my experiences uh, on this topic of dignity. And uh, my, my Whenever I give a talk on dignity, it's, um, it's usually always the same. And I'm going to say this to you, too, because my sense is that every single one of us in this room knows a lot already about dignity. And I think the, the simple contribution that I might have made is to put words to it, to give it a vocabulary, to, to um, enable people to talk about the, the many ways in which uh, dignity is important to all of you and to all of us and to all our lives. So first of all, I, I, I want to just share with you what I'm going to do. I've been given the charge by Carlos and, um, and Tim and others to, to sort of set the stage about dignity. I've, I've spent m practically my adult career trying to figure out this issue and the role that it plays and why it's why, in our lives and why it's so important to all of us. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background of how that all came about. And then I'm going to define dignity so that we're all on the same page and we have a common understanding of it. And in addition to that, I'm going to uh, point out some common misunderstandings about dignity. And there are a few. And I will then go into some research about really, to me, mind-boggling research about uh, dignity that validates the, the topic. And um, then I'm going to share with you what I call the 10 elements of dignity, which are the 10 ways in which um, we feel that our dignity can be honored, and I'll, I'll explain more about that. If we have time, I'm going to talk about uh, another set of um, issues around dignity, ways in which we actually violate our own dignity and set ourselves up for violating the dignity of others. And lastly, I'm going to give you a, tell you a story about reconciling with dignity and how um, when I worked in Northern Ireland with victims and perpetrators of that conflict 30 years after uh, the conflict started and several years after the Good Friday Agreement was signed. I'm going to talk to you about how the BBC, who is responsible for this project, how they recognized that coming up with a political solution to the issues that divided the uh, two communities in Northern Ireland wasn't enough. There needed to be a, an opportunity for people on both sides of the divide who had suffered great losses. And we're going to focus on that human dimension of the suffering and how we use dignity as a way to promote and create the conditions for reconciliation. So that's my agenda. Well, let me first uh, start by telling you when I was writing this book, people would come up to me and say, oh, so I heard you're writing a book. What, what, what's it about? And I would say, it's about dignity. And they would look at me and they'd say, oh, that's just great. It's such an important topic. And, and then a couple seconds later, they would say, but what's there to, how can you fill a book about dignity? I mean, you could say just a couple of, and I, you know, I sort of chuckle to myself every time because I think therein lies the problem. It is so important to us, this issue, and I hope by the end I'll convince you of that. And yet, um, so little is understood. And when I started my research, you're not going to believe this, but in 2000, I think it was in 2004 when I started my research, there was nothing written about dignity. Nothing. It was in many titles. It, it was used um, as topic headings. But what I wanted to know was, what is it going to look like if I treat people with dignity? What's it going to look like if um, my... Um, you know, I get the, the wounds to my dignity acknowledged. How do I go through that process of healing wounds to my dignity? So these were the kind of questions that I had. No one had addressed them. At, that's in 19, uh, 2004. So here's, here's how I 
became convinced of the power of dignity and the role that it plays in conflict. As Carlos mentioned, I'd been doing convening dialogues all my uh, career, all, all over the world, started out in Israel, Palestine, and um, through, this is through my program at Harvard, and did a big project with, and with Tim also in Sri Lanka, and uh, we did work in Northern Ireland. I even did some uh, dialogue work um, with Cuba, and Miami Cubans, and Sylvia's here, she was part of a lot of that uh, work. And, but but the, it's, it's, I think the most important thing that I want con to convey to you is that no matter where I was in the world convening these dialogues, and we were trying to bring the p parties together in order to address the political issues that divided them. I mean, it makes sense. We wanted to give them an opportunity to think together about how to address these issues. And I would be sitting at these tables and Again, no matter which conflict uh, was being addressed at the table, I sensed that there was a, another conversation taking place in the room. And it's the conversation that didn't have words. It was the unspoken conversation. We talked and we talked about the politics and about the problems, but it was clear, if you were at all a sensitive person, that, and you could feel the undercurrent that was present in the room. There was a profound emotional undercurrent that in my view was really running the show. It wasn't about, you know, we can't seem to find the right solution because the people in the rooms with whom we dealt, I can promise you were really smart people. They were leaders in their communities and there was no shortage of intellectual ideas about how to resolve these conflicts. So what was going on? Under, what, and I would always say that this emotional undercurrent, these, this highly charged uh, sense was under the table. And I knew that in order to really address the political issues, we were going to have to find a way to bring the, the, all of the emotional reactions to the, to the top of the table, not, the, you know, not just the political issues. So you know, I was thinking to myself, so what if, what if I said to these very high-powered negotiators, okay, tell me about a time when you felt emotionally wounded by the other side. Well, can you imagine how far that conversation would go? Nobody wants to talk about their wounds. Nobody wants, especially psychological and emotional wounds. And in fact, so there was a time when I actually used the word trauma, thinking, oh, well, that's better. Maybe if I ask parties to talk about their traumas, then maybe, you know, maybe that would open up the uh, conversation. But guess what? Nobody, people hated that word trauma. They didn't want to be considered traumatized and therefore have something you know, sort of mentally wrong with them. It's not about that. So one day, when I was thinking about what, what's, what, what words could we put to this, to what I'm trying to describe, and I realized it was about, you know, it, was, it, it would go something like this. How dare you treat us this way? Can't you see we're human beings? Don't you know that when we're treated so unfairly that we're going to react to this? So then I started thinking about that. What is that about? And it didn't take me long, honestly, to, to, to figure out that those unspoken conversations in the room, which many of you know, those are the conversations that really need to, to take place. You know, what isn't said is often more powerful than what is said. And so I thought, what if we call these undercurrents, you know, what if, it's, what, if, what if we talk to them, talk about them as wounds to dignity, as injuries to our dignity? I said, that's what this is about. This is about people's dignity. And so I remember feeling like I, I had an epiphany at that point that, yes, I think if we talk about the, this underlying, um, you know, undercurrent that, uh, in dignity terms, that perhaps we could we could address them and then we could move on to problem solving because without those, those emotional issues addressed, I, don't, I couldn't see any hope for real sustainable problem solving and negotiating. So I tried this out, one, uh, I had the courage to try this out one, um, one it was in 2004, I was in uh, South America doing an intervention between the military and the Department of Defense in Colombia and I, um, I was asked by the president to come and give a communication skills workshop because they were having a terrible time, absolutely terrible time. It was all throughout the media. Anyway, very long story short, 
what happened was I decided, okay, I accepted the invitation to come and try to help mediate the conflict, but I realized I wasn't going to talk about communication skills, that I was going to talk about dignity. I was going to try it out for the first time. And so I got there, and uh, we were in the meeting room, and the president walks in, and he says, well, Donna, Professor Hicks, he said, well, thank you so much for coming, um, and I understand you're going to do communication skills uh, workshop here for my colleagues. Could you just tell us a little bit about what you're going to do? And then I looked at him, I like, took a really deep breath, and I said, Mr. President, with all due respect, I, uh, I'm not going to do a communication skills workshop here, but my, my instinct tells me, and my experience from working all over the world on these kinds of conflicts, is that when relationships break down to this extent, that there are always underlying and unaddressed dignity issues that need to be uh, brought to the table. And I waited a minute and I looked over at him and he was paused, had paused, and he, he by the way, he was just there to introduce us, me and, he was, and my colleague Jose Maria Argueta, and we, he was about to leave after he made the introductions. He heard that I was going to be focusing on dignity and he turned to his scheduler and he said, cancel my meetings in Bogota, I'm staying for this, for this conference. I thought, oh no, here I am experimenting with dignity for the first time and the president is going to stay. But long story short, um, we spent two days talking about dignity and lo and behold, when I asked every single person in the room if they wanted to share a story about times in which they felt their dignity had violate, been violated, guess what happened? No guesses? Everybody had a story. Everybody had a story, and I could not, I couldn't stop them. We had to put a time limit on it because it was go, ca carrying on too far and too long. And, but the interesting thing that I asked them to do was not only talk about ways in which they had been violated, the second session was to talk about ways in which they had violated somebody else in the room. So it was a balance, because it's very easy for us to understand ways in which we have been injured by our dignity, but it's harder to see, and because oftentimes it's just very unconscious reactions that we have, ways in which we uh, violate other people. So that was how this whole thing started, and honestly, I felt like I, under, I understood, I had a missing link in my understanding of conflict that was addressed finally, because this was gnawing at me, this issue of how to get that, those highly charged dignity issues to the table was, was, um, was taking over my, my consciousness. So I was so happy. And again, I think the, what I found was, and it didn't matter where I was in the world. It did not matter. The same issues came up. And I actually believe that I, our common yearning for dignity is our highest common denominator. It's our highest common denominator, and I believe that a focus and an emphasis on dignity can unify us. And I have examples, I mean, Tim has, a, where did Tim go, by the way? He has, oh, there you are. Tim has examples of people with whom uh, Beyond Conflict has worked that, to show that this is possible. And um, so I do believe that we've tapped into some, a, a universal human yearning to be treated as if we matter, all of us. And you know what, the sad part about this is that when, when we experience vi violations to our dignity, it not only affects us, but it destroys the relationship. All our, our relationship, it breaks down and it's very, very hard to put together again. Because once dignity has been injured, trust is the first thing that goes out the window. And so the lion's share of rebuilding these relationships has to do with creating uh, new trust and bringing bringing a sense of safety back into the relationship. So what is dignity? What is it? Oh, how do, well, let's see here. Forgot I had my PowerPoint, okay. So that was why dignity, and then, oh shoot, don't look at that, okay. Okay, so what is dignity? What, what words come to mind when you think of dignity? Anybody? Respect. Always the first word out, respect, yes. Anybody else? Tolerance, yep, good. Self-confidence, Self yes, absolutely, yep. 
Ah, uh, wow, that's an interesting one. We're going to talk, I'll talk about that one later, absolutely. So, but, so not to uh, waste any time, I just want to tell you that I have a very simple definition of dignity. I decided that when I started working on this issue that I couldn't use my academic analytical hat to understand this because these issues are profoundly emotional issues and they, they are at the core of our, our humanity as human beings. So I, I realized that the simpler we can make these concepts in order for them to be understood the better. And our dignity in my mind is by the way different from respect and in a second I'll tell you, I'll, try, I'll explain why I think it's different. In my mind, uh, dignity is something that we are all born with. Um, we are inherently valuable uh, and we are worthy no matter what. When, just by virtue of being born and by virtue of the miracle of life, every single one of us is, um, it has value and worth. Now there's other piece of it that might not be so obvious to you. You might say, well, that's very obvious. But the not so obvious piece is that we are all, as, as much as we're born valuable, and worthy, we're also born vulnerable. And we're vulnerable to having that dignity violated, just as much as we're vulnerable to a physical wound. So, but yet, we, don't, we tend not to think um, about wounds to our dignity and ways in which we might dismiss other people or shame them or humiliate them. We tend not to think about them as you know, needing attention and needing healing, but trust me, they do. So if you have any trouble uh, imagining that we're all born worthy, I, I found this slide and I think it speaks, uh, speaks uh, volumes because is there any question in our mind, you see that precious young thing, is there any question in our mind that that baby has inherent value and worth? And furthermore, I think we would say that this child is invaluable, priceless even, and irreplaceable. There's only one of that one and then, you know, that's it. So if you think about how easy it is for us to see this in each other when we're infants, you know, it's, a, it's part of the human tragedy that we lose touch of that, that we lose sight of that. And, and part of, the, I think, the most significant thing we lose sight of is the vulnerability to, to that dignity. These, the, we need to have our dignity um, protected from the moment we're born till the day we die. Otherwise, we get ourselves into terrible, terrible trouble. Now the difference between dignity and respect, in my mind, dignity is something each and every person uh, comes into the world with. We're all born valuable and we're all born worthy. Respect, on the other hand, I think is earned. If I say that I respect somebody, I wanna, I wanna say, wow, I really admire what that person has done. I wanna be like that person. I want, I want you know, I'm inspired by that person, by what he or she does. But dignity, it's a baseline. It's what all of us start out with and it's what all of us end up with. And the, the research, I wanted to share some really interesting research with you about this because um, as Tim and, and uh, all the people at Beyond Conflict know, neuroscience has done miracles, wonders for us in the conflict world and in the psychological world in general because what it's done is it with with brain imaging scanners with these f functional magnetic resonance imaging they're able to see what parts of the brain are affected under certain circumstances that hu that human beings are put in and so there was a um, there's a, a group out in uh, UCLA that pointed out that when we have a uh, a physical wound and here's a guy who broke his arm and he's got a nice cast, real pretty red cast on there. And by the way, you know, we get so much attention when we get these kinds of physical injuries. We, everybody's, oh, you poor thing, how, you know. But, and, and it shows up in the brain, in, a, in the most primitive parts of our brain, in some, an area called the limbic system. It's where pain is centered and we feel it intensely. But here's the catch, that when our dignity is violated, what these researchers have shown us is that it shows up in the brain in the same area as a physical injury. So folks, the brain doesn't know the difference between a wound to our dignity and a physical wound. When I read this, everything changed for me. Everything changed because I was able to take it out, this, uh, these ideas out onto the road and say, look folks, we have to pay attention to this. This is, and in fact, if you were, uh, I believe that this is a public health crisis. I believe we are suffering that 
I mean, this is not just about international conflicts, although we see it, it's rampant in international conflicts. But dignity violations are occurring everywhere, everywhere people cluster, and that they're not being recognized. So listen, you know, when we get a physical wound, there's a, we, we have a 911 call, right? We have doctors who are there at the emergency room ready to take care of us. But when we have a wound to our dignity, it's the opposite. It is such a shameful experience. We don't even want to admit. I mean, sometimes we don't even want to admit that, it's, it's, that we've had these experiences because it's too embarrassing. So, and because of that, what happens is these dignity uh, injuries stockpile in us. And it doesn't take but a little scratching of the surface to have those, uh, a reaction to these dignity violations uh, make, to make them explosive. So if you endure years and years and years of dignity violations, you are going to be at the ready for um, reacting in a violent, often, way. Uh, if not physically violent, then certainly psychologically violent way. So we have to pay attention to these things. So my next question then is, so what does it look like? Remember I told you that I, I really wanted to know what, what, what it m meant to honor people's dignity. It's one thing to say we have to we have to honor the dignity of everybody. In fact, it's in, it's in the Episcopal Church covenant, in their baptismal covenant. It's in the teachings of the Catholic Church. It's in the teachings of Islam. It's in the teachings of so, uh, Universalist Unitarian Church, that dignity is something that we all have to uphold and, and honor in each other. But, so what does that look like? And, you know, I want to tell you another little story um, about um, a trip that I took to Ireland last year. I went um, to Dublin. I was there giving talks to a lot of different political groups, both in Ireland and Northern Ireland. And I met with a police commissioner there. And he wanted to meet with me because he had, he had, done, um, he had discovered that the migrant workers who came to Ireland to work were being treated very badly. And he, just, he was a new commissioner. He wanted to address this right away, nip it in the bud, and make sure that the people who came in to do all this agricultural work were treated well. So he met with me and he showed me his presentation about all his program that he, had, he was trying to implement. And honestly, it was just remarkable, the sensitivity that this man had to, and his colleagues had to these dignity issues. And he asked me at the end, is there anything that you'd like to add, Donna? And I said, you've got it. You know, you've covered it, practically covered it all. And he just, you know, was sort of embarrassed, but, you know, I was giving him lots of praise. And then, and he said, you know, at the end of the day, it boils down to one question. And that question is, how do we want to make people feel? How do we want to make people feel? And honestly, that really sums up the, in my mind, the dignity issues, the whole concept of dignity, because we have the power within us to make people feel great when we honor their dignity, when we include them, and in a minute I'm going to show you all the elements, when we uh, accept their identity, when we acknowledge them, we can make people's day. But then on the other hand, if we do the opposite and violate dignity, we, we can make each other absolutely miserable. So the question that Jack Nolan, this commissioner of the um, Garda in, um, in, in Dublin, had such an effect on me, how do we want to make people feel? So if we want to make pe people feel good, there's 10 ways in which we can do it. And by the way, I, t I got all of this from uh, doing several interviews, I mean hundreds of interviews all over the world in uh, Asia, in Africa, North America, South America, the Middle East, asking people to tell me about times when their dignity had been violated. And these 10 themes emerged. These 10 themes emerged. Number one, People want their identity accepted, no matter who they are. And part of the, the great suffering that takes place in these international conflicts is when people's identity, as you know, I mean, you, you all know this. This is, nothing, this is nothing new. When people feel marginalized because they belong to some particular identity group. And recognition, we all want recognition for our unique experiences, our way of life. This is very closely connected to identity because if you have, like say, a majority and a minority group working or living in the same state, they're going to want to speak their language, they're going to want to practice their religion. And so recognition is very um, close and tied into identity. But acknowledgement, 
Tim had talked about acknowledgement. Honestly, if there's one thing that I learned about um, how to address people's concerns, being able to just acknowledge what they've been through, just say, you may not agree with it, but just to give a person the acknowledgement that, yeah, I understand what, what you're saying, I understand what you've been through, and um, I've heard you, and I've listened very carefully. Now, Tim told me about some research that I didn't know about that, that from neuroscience, because they are, they are doing this big project on the neuroscience and conflict. But Tim told me that yesterday that when people feel that they've been acknowledged, especially when they're riled up, because dignity violations, we have a visceral reaction to dignity violations. We have a, our um, sympathetic ner nervous system gets kicked in, we have our heart rate increases, our blood pressure raises. So, you know, there's physical effects of this. But what, what Tim told me was that when people simply hear an acknowledgement for what the person had, has been going through or what the community has been through, it does something in the brain. It, qu it quiets the brain down. So all that agitation and that, and you know, to me, it's disarming, literally disarming to be able to acknowledge um, uh, others' experiences. And inclusion, uh, Tim already focused on this. Um, this, is, this is one of the greatest sources of conflict when people feel excluded, either from the state, excluded from um, one's community, excluded, you know, even, even in our families, we, we have a very strong reaction when we're left out of something. But the, the other thing about um, the flip side of this is, when people do feel like they're brought into your, your circle of moral concern, because that's one of the exclusionary, you know, one of the, the really difficult things for people who've been excluded, and you all know this, is that you feel like you're not the person other people don't care about what happens to you. Their mo circle of moral concern does not include you. And safety, well, Tim also alluded to this. You know, we, we know we have laws that protect us from physical safety or from physical harm, but there is this psychological safety, this safety from being shamed, safety from being humiliated, from being marginalized. This is, um, this is when I work in the corporate world, honestly, this is the major, this is the major uh, finding that I came out of the corporate world is that people do not feel safe to speak up when their dignity is being violated. They just don't, because they're afraid of not getting the job promotion. They're afraid of what they call, they say to me, it's career suicide, are you kidding? I'm not gonna speak up to my boss. But safety is paramount. Well, fairness goes without saying. Um, you know, it, little kids know this from birth. If you, if you give two little kids candy, if you're the parent or caretaker, the first thing they, what's the first thing they do? Check it out, who's got, did I get, more or less than, so fairness is in our, all of these things are, are hardwired in, into us. When these things are threatened, our independence is threatened, we react. When our understanding, when we felt misunderstood. Now, one of the biggest problems with understanding is that we rush to judgment. O often, we rush to judgment about people and circumstances. Instead of giving them time to, to you know, to seek, to hear their point of view, to explain uh, their, experiences, explain their perspective. And benefit of the doubt, you know, honoring people's dignity really requires um, a, an element of trust. And, and this is the one my husband has the biggest trouble with. He said, are you kidding me? You're asking me to give everybody the benefit of the doubt? No way, people aren't trustworthy. So, but this is what we, what we need to do. This is where we need to go with this because the other neuroscience findings is that we can actually, we have neurons in our brains that actually pick up the emotions of other people. We, we, we all do it, whether we're conscious of it or not. And when you come into an interaction with someone and you, you're doubting that person, you're you know, scrutinizing and you're saying to yourself, well, I don't know if this guy's trustworthy, they'll pick up on that. They will pick up on it immediately and they will act not trustworthy. And, but the other side is equally as true. If you come into an interaction with an open mind and you want to experience the, the, that person, you want him or her to unfold in front of you, people will, under, people will get that and you will get trusting people. I mean, this sounds like Pollyanna, but fortunately, neuroscience, again, has given us the evidence that we need to show how important it is. And, and accountability, well, so if you're anything like me, 
and I call myself a recovering dignity violator. I, uh, I've spent a lot of time um, in, in failed relationships, and I've, I've hurt people, and I've uh, dishonored people's dignity. And fortunately, what I've learned is that if we apologize, if we come to that person and say, look, I, I'm really sorry that I, I messed up, I, I hurt you, um, and I'm really going to try to change my behavior, and you know, it works miracles. But uh, as you well know, apology is not something that comes easily, right? And holding yourself responsible and doesn't come easily. How much time do I have? Oh, good. Oh, yippee, I can do all this. Okay. So um, how do you want to make people feel? Try honoring these, these 10 elements of dignity. Try accepting people's identity, showing recognition, acknowledgement, understanding benefit of the doubt, safety, all of these things. And if you mess up, just say, I'm sorry. As hard as it is, it just say, I'm sorry. So the last, uh, the last sort of building block of the model that I want to share with you is probably the most important, honestly. These elements of dignity, you're probably sitting there saying, yeah, these make sense. This sounds like common sense. So, but this part probably won't sound like common sense to you. So, what I discovered, I, I, there's a whole literature, there's a whole um, literature on evolutionary psychology. And this literature is basically focusing on the, the parts of uh, each and every one of us, parts of our brains that are hardwired for survival. And I'm sure many of you, you've all heard about fight and flight response, where, you know, when somebody threatens you, you, you have a, um, um, a reaction to either fight or flee. Well, this is completely normal because it's part of our hard wiring. Now, the problem is though those higher hard wirings and those instincts that we have, they may work in the service of survival, but they are also they also wreak havoc on relationships. And our job is to make, make, make conscious the many other ways. Fight and flight are just two ways in which we react instinctively. But there's all these other ways that I discovered. So, for example, taking the bait. When someone treats us badly, we feel like we have the right. Our instincts tell us, fight back. Our instincts tell us, get even. Our instincts tell us, seek revenge. Well, that is not the prettiest part of our human experience, let me tell you, our, our humanity. That's the part that wants us to survive over everything else. That part doesn't care about relationships, doesn't care about empathy, doesn't care about taking the perspective of the other. So the, when, we, when we get these, 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 temp, these, what I call the 10 temptations to violate our own dignity, when these become activated, our job, and I think this is the better part of dignity, is to practice restraint. How do we hold ourselves back so we don't end up becoming dignity violators ourselves and, and harming the dignity of others? So the, the person over here said saving face, yeah. Well, so uh, th this profound wiring that we have in us, because, the, you know, in evolutionary terms, we didn't want to look bad in the eyes of other people because that meant that we would be physically, you know, our daily lives would be threatened because there was a chance that we'd get thrown out of the group. So saving face is an immediate knee-jerk reaction to ha being exposed that there's something that you did that was wrong. So my favorite guy who does this, I mean, I have so many favorites. They come out every day in the news, but Lamstar Armstrong is my favorite. Because think about how he deceived himself, how he tried to cover up. He, he, he deceived himself so much that he um, actually ended up suing people, you know, thinking that. So, so face saving is something we all have to stop ourselves. And what's the, what's the, what's the, the um, other um, one of these instincts that's very linked to face saving is shirking responsibility. We don't want to take responsibility when we've done something wrong. Again, it's part of not wanting to look bad in the eyes of others. And false dignity, I was gonna, I'm going to just skip that one a little bit because it's more about how, where we derive our dignity. The fact is we have to, many of us want um, praise and approval from other people and that's where we derive our dignity almost solely. But the fact is if we don't have our own uh, awareness of that inherent value and worth, that sort of anchor that we always have, no matter what we do or what we say, if we only pursue this other kind of dignity where we're getting recognition from the outside, well, I, 
I believe that we're pursuing false dignity. And s security the same way. We'll stay in a relationship that's, that's hurtful far too long, thinking that our, you know, our dignity is on the line and we can't do anything about it. Avoiding confrontation, avoiding face-to-face -face confrontation. This is another instinct because, again, we don't want to put ourselves on the line. And here's probably my favorite one. Assuming that we're an innocent victim in a failed relationship, that we don't have any part to play, and that we have this righteousness about uh, our role, that oh, he's all bad or they're all bad and we're all good. And the fact is, in, in most uh, human dynamics when relationships fail, there is a, a give and take. There's a kind of reciprocity of um, responsibility that needs to be taken. And resisting feedback is, is related to that. We do not want to hear what other people see. And the fact is, folks, we all have blind spots and everybody else can see what we can't see and we resist getting that feedback. So again, these are all ways in which, in which we violate our own dignity if we don't have an awareness of these. Blaming others, shaming and blaming others to deflect our guilt. Well, we've got a lot of politicians. I mean, there's millions of examples. And here's the thing about gossiping. I was so surprised to, to read the literature about gossip because what happens is that when we experience these wounds to our dignity and we have the, uh, an, um, an instinct that wants us to avoid confrontation, we don't want to speak up when someone's violated our dignity, typically. So the negative energy of those violations has to go somewhere. And what happens? It goes into the gossip mill. So if I don't, let's say Sylvia and I have a bad interaction and I, I'm afraid to go to Sylvia and talk to her about it, what I will do is I'll turn to Carlos and I'll say, Carlos, uh, did you, can you believe what Sylvia did? You know, she, so we talk about each other and that's the way of dispelling this negative energy. So, and I'm saying we've got to do the face-to-face -face thing, people. This is, we've got to fight those instincts to just put negative things out there in the, in the uh, atmosphere and really go and do face to face. So that's, those are my building blocks. I've just given you the building blocks of, what my, of all my dignity work. And I wanna share a story with you to, to, to finish about ways in which we, I put this together, um, all of this together to what I call reconcile with dignity. And I say it's as good as forgiveness because what I am proposing is in some ways it's an alternative to forgiveness. Forgiveness is great. I love it. I've done it myself. I'm, I'm really all for it. I just think some of us need an option where, where we, we can't bring ourselves to actually forgive the act um, of injury, whatever it is. But we, I think reconciling with dignity can give us a, another way out, a way to address the past and address the issues, but on the other hand, um, we don't have to use the language of dignity. So, so, so what does it take to reconcile with dignity? So here, I had an opportunity in Northern Ireland, I mentioned it, and um, I was asked uh, by the BBC to c facilitate dialogues between victims and perpetrators along with Archbishop Desmond Tutu and another woman whose husband had died in uh, the Rwanda genocide. So we had brought these victims and perpetrators together for, fifth, um, for a face to face encounters with the hope that it would lead to a sort of demonstration, a healing demonstration. Because as I told you early on, that the, the, the wounds that happen to human beings in times of these terrible intractable conflicts, um, they don't go away with the signing of a political agreement. These deep dignity wounds have to be addressed in order for people to let go of it and put the past to rest. And the BBC recognized that. So they thought if we televise these encounters and give people an opportunity to see what a healing process would look like and what a healing with dignity would look like, then maybe we'd have some hope to, to you know, address the divisions that are still taking place in, in, the, in the streets of Belfast. So we, we did that and we, uh, oh, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Even though I've been espousing this reconciling with dignity for years, ha actually having a face-to-face, -face, uh, an opportunity where these, these uh, victims and perpetrators could sit across the table from one another was, was extraordinarily powerful. And so one, I think the first thing that it takes is 
we're not going to resolve these dignity issues um, politically, and we need to sit down. We need to sit down and look into the eyes of the other and have a conversation where people's dignity is being um, hopefully restored and the, the, the conditions that we create are conditions for that dignity to be restored. And it, it goes without saying, this kind of face-to-face -face process, we need a trusted facilitators. And fortunately, Archbishop Tutu had so much experience with this in South Africa that it translated beautifully here to, to Northern Ireland. And here, again, as I stated earlier, there needs to be a distinction between the political issues and this emotional human toll. I mean, it was so sad to hear about the losses that people experienced, whether it was a loved one or the loss of, even a loss of sense of power, you know, the powerlessness that so many of the victims' wives and husbands felt when the people died. It's a tremendous loss. And that, treating those losses and those injuries requires a different process than a political process. And at the very bottom, you know, I, I remember when we were all through and I was giving a talk in Boston and I wrote to the Archbishop and I said, um, so, you know, I want to quote you on a few things. And I said, what do you think, what do you think is the central, most important key ingredient in creating these dignified conditions that is necessary for this kind of recon uh, rec reconciliation? And he said, well, you know, when people feel roughed up, they always need acknowledgement for what happened. I mean, those, that's his words. When people feel roughed up, that we need a public, and he even thinks a public acknowledgement for what happened. So I cannot overestimate how, uh, overemphasize how important these face-to-face -face encounters are, how we focus only on, not the political issues, but the human experiences of these conflicts, so that that suffering can be addressed. And, Vulnerability. So here we are with vulnerability again. So at the end of every session with the victims and the perpetrators who sat across the table from one another, the archbishop would turn to them and say, thank you for making yourselves vulnerable. Thank you for making yourselves vulnerable to the possibility that you might be re-traumatized again by sitting here. And yet, you know, the opposite happened and let me just say one little short thing about what happened with one of these pairs, a British policeman and an IRA guy sat together. One, the policeman almost died, the IRA guy shot him, very, very close, came close to uh, dying. And what we did was we gave each party, each guy, an opportunity to talk about, tell his story, and tell his story in any way he wanted. We had eight hours together for these. So they could, it was the show, television shows were edited down to 40 minutes, but they could talk as long as they wanted to. And so Ronnie, uh, the policeman told his story, the IRA man told his story, and at the end, one of the questions, I think maybe it was the archbishop asked, so, so now that you've heard Ronnie's story, Ronnie was the IRA guy, so he said to the police officer, now that you've heard the story, what the conditions were that this guy grew up under and everything, what, what, how do you feel about this guy? And the British police officer turned to Ronnie and said, the IRA guy, and he said, well, after listening to you and after hearing in such detail about how you grew up, what life was like being an Irish uh, nationalist living in a British state, he said, I have a feeling that if I grew up under those same circumstances, I'd probably do exactly what you did. And it was just this remarkable identification with this man. And again, it was because we created these conditions where people could tell their stories face to face in a very safe environment, because we the facilitators were not going to let anything get out of hand. And we were, you know, we, we talked a lot with the, with the participants about this. So making themselves vulnerable, and, for, and they both did. Both of the, and all of the victims, and even the perpetrators, they, they really, um, I think this was one of the things that just I found the most surprising. And the other thing about this is that uh, what I discovered, you know, I'm always very cautious about victims, and I'm always very careful. I've always been a sort of an underdog uh, advocate and wanting the victims to be so protected and, and you know what I realized at the end of all of this? Never underestimate the power of a victim because they're capable of so much more 
than what we think they're capable of. They can make themselves vulnerable. They can identify with other people. They can make themselves bigger by including the experience of the other in their narrative. And in fact, what I say, that if you, wanna, if you want a real good indicator of uh, healing, and you do these kinds of face-to-face -face encounters, what ends up by happening is they create a new story. They don't go back to their old narratives. And the narratives that they create are bigger than both of them. They're bigger than both of them because they included, and again, here's another example of inclusion. So, but you, you're not gonna be able to do that if you don't bring people together for these what I call dignity dialogues. You're not gonna be able to do it. And finally, generosity. You know, we, we, human beings are really very generous. We are really generous by nature. You know, we want to connect. There's all kinds of literature that shows that we were born uh, to connect, we're wired to connect and to be empathic for, uh, toward one another. And what happens in these conflicts is that because we have this, you know, we have this sort of human struggle where we want to connect, but on the other hand, we have all of these self-preservation instincts when the relationship feels threatening. What happens is we lose that natural empathy that we're all born uh, into the world with. We lose that generosity that we, you know, what, that we enjoy giving just as much as we enjoy receiving. That we, we, lo we lose all that beautiful stuff about the human condition. So I say, let's get to work, you know? This is why all I'm doing now is providing people opportunities to have these dignity conversations because we need to get back to that, the big, bigger parts of ourselves who we are, the generous part, the empathic part, the compassionate part, the part that wants to connect, and the part that has been lost and to address that healing as well. So, um, and in, in the end, it's, it's really about restoring empathy. And I, I, I want to just end by saying to you that, um, oh, I just learned so much in this process. I, I, you, know, you have to be careful what you, what you hope for and you ask for in your dreams because I got it when I was able to do this work with Archbishop Tutu. I cannot tell you how much I learned from him, just his graciousness and his willingness to give the benefit of the doubt and how he opened himself up even to the, mo the guy the guys who did the most heinous things. We had uh, Michael Stone, I don't know if any of you who know the, that conflict, but um, he did just unspeakable things. And yet, he forced us all on the, on the facilitation to team to do all this, to make ourselves vulnerable in the face of them, be generous with them, look for their humanity. And so, but you can imagine that I told you we're eight hours with these, every single pair. So we had eight hours, uh, and we did it for 12 days with, with six pairs, one day in between to recover. And so we walked out of this first session at the end, you know, it was like five o'clock, and we're dragging. We had the producers, the three of us who are facilitating, and we said, uh, you know, we, maybe we should sit down and debrief this, you know, before we do anything else. Let's sit, it's fresh. Let's sit down, debrief this um, experience that we've had so that we can be sure we'll do a good job you know, when we do our next pair. And the archbishop turned around and he said, with a really stern look on his face, which was very unusual, but he said, you are not going to do a debrief. And we said, oh, okay. And he looked at his watch and he said, it's five o'clock, I'm gonna go upstairs, I'm gonna take a rest. He said, and I want you to go out, get some fresh air. He said, because if we focus any more on this negative energy that has filled this, this building. If we add more negative energy, oh, you didn't do this right, you didn't do that right. He said, we're never gonna make it. He said, we're never gonna make it for two weeks. In fact, we have to do the opposite. He said, I want you to come down back into the living room, because it was in a private house. He said, I want you to come back into the living room in an hour, and we're going to have cocktails, we're going to play music, we're going to sing, we're going to dance, we're going to have a party every single night after these encounters. And we thought, oh, we're just standing there stunned. You know, okay, we can do that. You know, we can have fun. And the reason he told us this is that, you know, having done all these interviews in South Africa for, I don't know, how many years did he do it? Like three years he was interviewing the victims for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He got prostate cancer, and he is convinced that he took in too much of that 
sadness, too much of that human suffering without balancing it out with joyfulness. And so I'm going to end this by saying to you, uh, telling you the last bit of wisdom that he shared with us. As we're standing there stunned, he went running up the stairs. And those of you who've met him know the little giggle and the sort of childlike nature of this man. And so he giggles because he knew he had gotten us, right? And he turned around and he said, one more thing. And we thought, oh, no, now what did we do? One more thing, he said. It's our duty to be joyful. Here he was accepting the uh, Nobel Prize in uh, Oslo. He walks the talk, folks. It's our duty. We got enough. We've done enough hard things. And for those of us who are working on these issues, we, we've got to do it differently. We've got to put more joy into this and get us ourselves back to, oh, you know, you know, what, you know what I mean. It's our duty to be joyful. So that's where I'm going to end. And thank you. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>